Welcome. Okay, uh, we're going to get started here uh, tonight. Um, and uh, this was a really popular uh, session that we had. Uh, we, we're doing a series of webinars, about 11 different webinars uh, across the state and actually across the country this year from the Illinois University of Illinois Extension Small Farms team. And uh, this was one of the most popular ones that we had uh, in terms of sign up for these, uh, these sessions. So we're really excited to talk to you about this tonight. So we'll get going here. Um, so on the title we have, you know, what, what do we mean by unique? And, and basically what we're talking about when we talk about unique is, is something maybe uh, different or, or something that we're not used to uh, because of the size. So their size, uh, color may be a variation, make them unique, and um, or because they aren't easily found in uh, in a grocery store that you would walk in. So unique means many things, uh, but that's some of the things that we deal with. And what's really interesting uh, is about food is culture. So as our um, as our population, our local locally, our demographics are changing. You know, communities are are, are more diverse in in population and ethnicity. So what our customers or your customers are requesting now is probably different from what you um, may have offered even a decade ago. And so uh, a lot of the, the different uh, uh, ethnic populations we have, they, they remember food from their home countries and, and they remember the culture about it. So being able to access and find these foods uh, locally is, very, is really very important to them. So you've heard the taste, you know, you've heard the comment about uh, think globally, act locally. Well, when we're talking about unique vegetables, um, basically what you can kind of think of in terms of marketing is, you know, uh, think globally but market locally. So if you have these products available uh, for some of these um, uh, markets, non-traditional vegetables for these markets, you might be able to uh, really establish a foothold in the market and, and, in, and increase your customer base. Okay, so what we're going to do tonight is three or four of us are on here and, and we each have uh, different uh, topics uh, or varieties of vegetables we're going to talk about and, and we'll go through as, and, and I'll introduce people as they start to talk. So we've each got about two or three of these and we're just going to give you a, you know, we don't have much time tonight to go over a lot of things. What we want to do is probably give you enough information that you can begin to um, ask some more questions about some of these products that you might want to buy, maybe do some more research into your market that you have, and uh, uh, start growing some of these. So I'm going to start out and uh, we'll go right through these. So the first one is uh, arugula, and uh, many of you might already grow arugula, um, but um, uh, you don't see it a lot in the marketplace. Arugula is uh, very popular uh, in, in restaurants. And it's a uh, it's a mustard green. Arugula is very easy to grow. Um, it's a spicy, uh, peppery type of green, uh, and um, it tolerates a wide variety of soil conditions. So that's that's a good thing about it too. It's not hard to grow. Okay, and. Uh, as you can see by this slide here, uh, growing it basically, you know, likes cool temperatures, uh, grown from seed uh, in the early spring or late fall, so you can get two different uh, crops. Uh, and basically, if you harvest, harvest it correctly, you know, you can harvest for a long time, but you can do two separate plantings of those. And uh, um, it says, you know, thin to one plant every four to six inches, depending on your conditions, you might be able to get a, a lot tighter. Uh, spacing on that. But um, the thing about growing arugula is um, you want to make sure that you stagger those plantings because uh, it's very quick growing and what you'll find is if you don't stagger the growings, um, you basically have, you can't sustain the harvest of it long term. So so that's very important, okay? Um, it's a very, it's a slow a slow crop to bolt, obviously moisture stress and heat causes bolting of this. And another neat thing about arugula is that it is great for intercropping. So for instance, if you're growing in a high tunnel and space is very limited, you want to make sure that you're growing some arugula in there. How you harvest it, uh, basically it's cut and bunched and much like you do spinach and you want to make sure you keep it cool and out of the sunlight, uh, it is very perishable. 
So you want to make sure you get that cooled down, you know, very quickly. And, and most of the time, arugula and a lot of the greens we're talking about are fresh harvested and, and then immediately taken to a market. So it is very perishable, uh, but it's a great, great product out there. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've got another one I'm going to cover here tonight, and uh, that's Swiss chard. And uh, Swiss chard is a close relative of the beet. Uh, if you've ever, I think the next slide I may have a picture of one of the seeds. If you've ever grown it, the, se the seed basically does look like a beet seed. Uh, but it's grown for the, the, the tasty, rich leaves, you know, rather than the, the, the roots. And this is just a picture of several varieties that we have out there, okay? So um, you want to plant uh, chard, and there's so many different varieties. I really don't have time to go over all of them uh, of chard out there. But plant about 30 days before the last frost date uh, in your area. An exception to that would be um, basically the rhubarb chard is a variety that you want to delay planting until after the last frost, OK? So uh, it's not damaged by any frost potential. Okay, and um, six to ten seeds per foot, about an inch deep, so it doesn't go very uh, deep at all, and uh, it will require thinning uh, in order for them to reach their mature size, and they can get two to two and a half feet tall. Now, um, you know, that's a pretty mature plan, and, and, and what people will do uh, many times is, is they'll, it's a continuous harvest on the plants, as you can see here, through the whole growing season. But the smaller the plants are, the more succulent they are. You want to make sure you harvest the outer leaves first and leave these inner new leaves to grow. So that's what you'll be harvesting uh, uh, later on. And when you harvest those, make sure that you uh, harvest with a sharp knife. Uh, a lot of times growers will, later in the season, they'll cut the plant uh, three inches from the top of the soil completely off and let the whole thing come back. So it's another great plant. And the whole plant is edible, so consumers really, uh, really like to use that. Okay, how is it sold? Just like most of the greens, bundles of varying sizes uh, by the pound or the bundle. Um, bundles, you can find everything across the board, but that's basically about 10 to 12 stems or one serving. Okay. Um, and uh, chard cooks down a great deal, so usually people, you know, may, may buy a lot of it because it'll really cook down very quickly, and it's very, very flavorful, so it's a great product. Okay, um, so what we're going to do now is uh, uh, my colleague James Theory is going to cover a few more of these, so James, you can take it over. Thank you. Okay, so ginger and turmeric are considered to be cousins, so most of what I'm going to say about Ginger will also apply apply pretty much to turmeric. I'm calling it turmeric as opposed to turmeric. That's what I was told this morning, turmeric. And then the other thing I want to say before I start is that they are not exactly vegetables. They are herbs or herbs, whatever you want, however you want to, uh, whichever way you want to pronounce that. But we do eat our vegetables with some herbs, so it's just relevant that they are with us. Yeah. So um, let me get on to the next slide here. So both ginger and turmeric are Eastern uh, Asia country. Uh, they were grown in China and India for the longest time before coming to the newer worlds, to Africa and to the Caribbean, and now a little bit into the Americas. And they are basically used as spices and they are also used as medicinal plants, and, and we'll be, I'll be mentioning that throughout my five-minute talk. And as you can see, they are both rhizomatous plants. That means we eat the part of the root of, that, uh, of those two plants. So they store their food in the roots, and that's what we harvest them for. Although back where it is grown on a large scale, the leaves are used also for other types of culinary purposes. And so you see those two pictures there of ginger and turmeric. Uh, the one on the right is turmeric. If you don't want to grow them for anything else, please grow them in your garden because the flowers are beautiful. And you're going to see some flowers as we go along. So both, both plants belong to the family Zingiberaceae, which is 
they, you know, it's a family. They are not in the same genus. So ginger is a perennial plant that is grown mainly in Asia, and it will grow up to three feet tall. And I have to say that because in the U.S., if we grow, if you try to grow it here, it won't grow as tall as three feet, mainly because we have a limitation of the weather. We don't have the right weather here. And of course, I've already said the part that is used is the rhizome. It can be used as a cooking spice and a tea additive. And the volatile oils and pungent phenolic compounds in it, the ginger oils and the sugar oils, are what make uh, the, the cookies, the ginger, ginger snaps that we eat, or the ginger ale that we drink, uh, taste the way it tastes. And the main producers are, of course, mainly based in, in, in Asia, although other places now have started growing. And it is marketed 80%, well, so the Asian countries produce 80% of it. That was a, a statistic given in 2008. But I was also going to say 80% of it is marketed as, as powder, 20% as fresh produce. And down there, I have mentioned a medicinal, one medicinal uh, thing that has been proved. It's that it reduces nausea. People that have motion sickness, if you go on, if you're going on a boat ride or in the, on a cruise, you, you take that along with you. And it is also good for other things like intestinal upsets, upsets. It's also good for thinning blood and also the morning after effects or the pregnancy complications that sometimes are encountered by women. It, it's able to deal with that as well. Next slide. Again, just pictures of turmeric. It's more orange. It's, it has a brighter color than ginger. See those beautiful flowers. And again, just showing that the root, the rhizome, is the part that we use. And it is also ground as a powder which is now an ingredient, becomes an ingredient of the curries that we use in our food, especially the Indian foods. Next slide. So turmeric, which is curcuma longa, has got curcumins. That's what it contains. That's what makes it uh, taste the way it tastes. And it is an, uh, it's an antibiotic, as well as a fighter of cancers and other infections. It's also an antioxidant in that it can sequester the free radicals that may uh, end up in our cells, in our bodies. And it is used in cooking and as a coloring in both butter and cheese. And this one can grow much taller, as you can see there. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll talk about how we grow both of them. Well, these are tropical plants, and we are heavily limited in our growing season by the fact that they require six to seven to eight, more like seven to eight months, sometimes nine months. So in the tropical world, that's not a problem, but we have a problem here. Therefore, we have to do what we can do to extend the season, any tricks we can do, and one of them is to pre-sprout them as early as you can, maybe in March, so that come May, you're able to plant outdoors when it is a bigger plant, and you're able then to hope for the best in terms of number of months that it can continue growing. You can grow store-bought rhizomes, but you risk uh, bringing in disease. When you buy from, and I'll be talking about East Branch Ginger Company, which is in North Carolina, you get them certified free of disease. So that's one thing. So um, you please proud them in cocoa peat or any of like the other types of uh, soft um, media, like vermiculite or pyrolite, those, those things. But then it has to be in warm soil. If warmth is a big factor. Even if you have to grow it outside, the, the soil has to be over 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you give them water. Light is not a big deal at this point in time. You give the rhizomes. It's actually the rhizomes that are in the, in the cocoa pit. You give them water, but they don't like wet feet. So do not overwater. People have also planted these two plants in pots, just as a house plant if they just want a few plants. But you can also start them in pots for later transplanting to the outside. 
The soil has to be well tilled, well drained. Compost is great for them as well as manure. And then you ensure that the soil is at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit and plenty of sunlight. Spacing of two by two feet is okay for us here in America, but if you are in the tropics, three by three would be fine because then you get a bigger plant. You are now getting very big plants. We also want them to crowd out a little bit because that's how you suppress the weeds. If you grow them into October, then you mulch the soil if it's starting to get cold. And then you harvest with tender loving care, wash, and get them dry because you don't dry them properly. You could get molds harvesting uh, happening on them. Next slide. So the main importers and consumers of this, uh, these two plants are in UK, USA, and Saudi Arabia. You see the Western world is heavily into importing these two uh, plants. And you know why. There's a lot of immigration to the West. You get a lot of people from those sides of Asia, and they need these plants. <coughs> if you take Chicago, for instance, there, there's a lot of diversity of people from all over the world. And also, Americans, Native Americans, you're also getting to like these plants because of the health aspects. People are getting to value health more and more, so they're asking for it. And growth, growing them is simple. If it wasn't for the shortage of growing time, there would be an okay crop to grow here. But you look at uh, the economics, the, the sentence there about economics in, in North Carolina. There is a company there, Eastern East Branch Ginger Company, that is growing ginger and not letting it go to maturity. That's why they're calling it baby ginger. So they're harvesting at five months for two reasons. One, you know, you don't know you don't now have the problem of the length of the growing season, that's one. Second, you, uh, you stay away from the competition because if you wait for the latter part of the year and Brazil and uh, Costa Rica, and Jamaica, they are all bringing in theirs, then you have competition, you get better prices. And you see they are making up to $15 per pound on this baby ginger. This morning I went to, K to Kmart and I bought ginger for $5 per pound. That's what they sold me for. They are sourced from Hawaii. So the other thing about them being medicinal is the, 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 there is a finding that when you eat ginger, you have decreased hunger. So if you have decreased hunger, then you don't eat more. Or it can be the other way around. By eating them, you feel satisfied, if the word satiated there is correct. You feel satisfied so you don't want to eat. So they could be a weight reduction factor. And those of you that have access to the internet, there is a baby ginger slideshow there, and you can go and watch. They do sell these baby ginger rhizomes, but I checked this morning, they've run out of, of, of this uh, seed, uh, seed, seed seed stock. They've already run out. They still have some tamarind, but the bigger demand is with the ginger plants. Okay. Thank you, James. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hand it over now, shut my mic off, and give it to my colleague, uh, Deborah Cavanaugh-Grant from uh, Springfield. Good evening, everybody. Well, um, as you might be aware, uh, the tomatillo is a small edible fruit in the Solanaceae family, and uh, it looks like a little um, lantern. It's tan to straw colored calyx. Uh, covers the fruit like a husk, and uh, it is sometimes referred to as a husk tomato. The tomatillos are native to Mexico and Guatemala. Um, one of the things when you think about tomatillos, especially in terms of uh, farmer's markets, if you're thinking of diversifying what you're selling at a farmer's market, uh, tomatillos are an ingredient that I think uh, you could consider growing. As it shows on the slide here, they're uh, easy to grow. They're really prolific. Uh, when they get going. They have few insects or disease problems, which is a nice benefit for them. Also, in terms of uh, growing them, you could grow them through the season and they have good storage ability and you could bring them to market across uh, several weeks. And as we already mentioned, it is a key ingredient in uh, a lot of uh, Latin American recipes and in salsas. The, um, next slide. 
so how do you grow these things? It's just a take-home message for growing tomatillos is they're extremely, they're just like toma field tomatoes. You grow them very similar to field tomatoes. You would start them as uh, transplants. A consideration in growing them both in a market and a garden would be uh, sprawl, letting them sprawl out similar to what you could do with tomatoes versus staking. Obviously, commercial growers would favor uh, the staking of the tomatillos. The spacing of these is about three feet apart. And then an important thing to do just with many of the plants that you grow is uh, the consideration of whether you want to use uh, mulch or plastic, but you probably should do one or the other. As you would do with tomatoes, you need to start these from seed six to eight weeks before the last frost, depending on where you live in Illinois or other people that are on our call from across the country. You need to plant after the danger of frost is passed. And this would be about at six to eight weeks. Kyle? So here's some examples of some uh, tomatillos, different varieties. I uh, was researching what is you know, commonly grown, and I was looking through several seed catalogs. And these were the varieties that I found across different catalogs. And so I wanted to make sure that these were readily available. Kyle? OK. The next crop we're going to talk about is celery. Well, I'm from Michigan, and I had an opportunity uh, when I was in college to work on a farm where celery was grown. And so in Michigan, it, it's a, uh, grown on a lot of acres. This happened to be a farm with muck soils. It's a beautiful crop. Uh, celery, I tried to grow it in my garden. I uh, was sort of successful, but I'll, we'll learn more why uh, we can have some problems with it. Celery um, and its cousin, Celerac, is, uh, if you look at it, you can see it there. It's this big, gnarly uh, root ball. It has a crisp texture, and it, it has a nice celery taste. So in looking at different recipes and things like that, people can eat it uh, mash. You can eat it all kinds of ways similar to any other uh, root crop that you might eat. It's easier to grow than celery, which is nice to know if you've had problems growing celery or have avoided growing celery because of the problem. It's also a crop, too, that doesn't have serious pest problems, which I think is important. It stores really well. So again, if you're a market gardener, I would consider growing this as a way just to diversify some of the things that you would be able to sell. And it is this unique item. In the, It's not eaten as much um, in the United States, but over in Europe, it's a very uh, common crop. Next slide. Well, how do you grow this crop? Uh, it's also a transplant. Uh, the planting is six to eight inches apart. It grows 18 inches apart. The main issue with growing celiac is that it needs consistent watering and a lot of water. So thinking about the summer that we had last year and the forecast for the possibility of a similar situation this year, I don't know if it would be a good idea to try it, but uh, if you do, you probably have something that would be unique for your farm stand. Cellurec has a requirement for rich soils that are high in organic matter, and it is a heavy feeder of uh, nutrient nitrogen. So how do you grow this? Another aspect to this is it has a very long growing season. You can see there are 120 days. It's important to start the seed early, obviously, to cap because of the long growing season. So 10 to 12 weeks before the average date of the last frost. And one of the other aspects of celiac, it takes a while for it to germinate, two to three weeks. And then here, a plant two weeks before the average last frost. Next slide. So again, I wanted to look around on the internet and in different seed catalogs for varieties that I could recommend to you as something to consider. And these three were the predominant varieties that I found, alabaster, diamond, and cog. And so how do you harvest this? When this root is three to four inches wide, some people use the leaves too in terms of, let's say, stews or things like that. And you can see on the slide in terms of the age to maturity, you have the first two are 120 days and the last is 100 days. OK. Thank you, Deborah. Um, and according to my notes here, um, next up is our colleague Chris Konichka. And Chris is out of Bloomington. I'm going to turn it over here to Chris. Chris, take it over. 
Okay, thank you. Growing uh, so-called Asian greens. Uh, many of the factors here will be similar to what Kyle presented for arugula. Uh, first, I thought I'd mention why one might want to grow these things. Uh, they're fast growing. They're cold tolerant, which means you can get uh, spring and fall crops, just like with arugula. The seeds will germinate in warm weather, allowing you an easy summer planting. And they're nutritious as well, including especially vitamins A, C, calcium, magnesium, and antioxidants. Uh, and it's one way to diversify your market. These things are getting more widely used right now, and uh, they're worth taking a look at. All right, so how do I grow these? Well, uh, they can be direct seeded or transplanted depending on your production system and your preference based on whether it's a spring or fall planting. They require consistent watering. If you think about uh, where these things are from, we're talking about the lush, green, mountainous areas of China and Japan. Uh, they're used to having water on the leaves. These are ones that might actually benefit from overhead watering in contrast to drip irrigation. Um, they survive at a variety of pHs. As you can see, 5.5 five to 7.5, five, that should pretty much cover most people's soil situation. They do have high potassium needs, um, so supplemental potassium uh, is definitely advised here. They can be planted densely um, the 6 to 12 inches would be uh, for something like bok choy, the spacing within the row, and you can space your rows at a foot apart. Uh, they benefit from row covers, especially early and late season, where you can get just a little bit of temperature protection that will allow them to survive that much earlier or that much later. As I mentioned, um, these can be planted spring, fall, or winter. Um, they can be sown at soil temperatures from 40 to 75 degrees. They generally emerge quickly. Of course, this is temperature dependent, but somewhere in the four to seven day range. Uh, for transplants, they can be transplanted at about three to five weeks, depending on the specific crop. And they're also great for high tunnels. Uh, doing so in high tunnels can give you some uh, crop as early as late April or May and as late as December, especially with the winters we've been having recently. So I just wanted to present a few of the different crops as there's many that fall into this Asian greens, uh, Asian vegetable category. Uh, pak choy and choy sum, also known as bok choy. Um, these things can be grown for full-sized heads or as harvested as baby greens. Um, they have a green or a white stem as you see in the pictures on the right side. Uh, they're really pretty out in the field as a group planting. Um, yeah, harvested as a full head or as individual leaves for something like a braising mix or as a tender portion of a salad mix to counteract some spicier leaves like that arugula that you're going to plant now. Um, they mature rather quickly uh, between 45 and 55 uh, days based on temperature. And in general, for bok choy and choy sum, the taste is mild, tender, and crisp. Another one you might see available is called gailan, um, also known as Chinese broccoli. Uh, if you take a look at the photo on the right, uh, it looks something like uh, secondary broccoli shoots or broccoli leaves before the head has emerged. Um, the main stem is harvested and then side shoots, just like with our traditional broccoli crop. Um, these are tender heads with crisp stems, and uh, they've got yeah a broccoli-like taste and survive under the same conditions. Next, we've got hinchoy, which is known as Chinese spinach. It comes in a variety of colors. Um, it looks uh, to be very colorful hill here, very beautiful. It can go in a variety of preparations. All of these things can, uh, from saute to braising under a uh, longer cooking time. In addition, there's kun choy, or Chinese celery. Uh, this is a high yielding crop. It's got a strong flavor and aroma, uh, somewhere between celery and celeriac. And, uh, the arrows hopefully keep clear which one is which right here. And the final one I'm going to talk about in this category is tatsoi. 
Uh, Tatsoi is a great salad mix green. It's one of the mild and tender ones um, that survives in a variety of temperature conditions. It's got a dark green rosette, um, which is the growth pattern shown in the bottom picture on the right. It can be harvested as the full head or as leaves to go in a mix or um, for solo use. It matures very quickly, a 45-day uh, crop, which can be a real advantage, especially in a high tunnel. Um, it'll also endure some pretty cold temperatures. And uh, yeah, it's mild and tender crispy. It's a great addition to salad mix. Give Totsoy a try. All right, so with these greens, what kind of stuff might you see in production? Um, there are a few common pests that are out there for these leafy vegetables. Uh, the same ones in other leafy type vegetables, imported cabbage worm, cabbage looper, aphids, and flea beetle. Um, in general, uh, general practice is just to pick out leaves that have been uh, eaten or significantly eaten by something like flea beetle. Uh, crop rotations are number one uh, control and prevention mechanism. Second, using row covers. Um, can help prevent those early season flea beetle infestations. And there's also um, BT treatments that can be applied to these plants to help prevent imported cabbage worm and cabbage looper as Lepidopterum pests. Um, and for uh, post harvest, they can uh, need to be washed uh, and then they can be stored uh, just above freezing at 32 degrees and at 95% humidity. That's very high humidity. Um, in general, they'll keep a week to two weeks, depending on how well those conditions are met. Of course, at higher temperatures, they won't last quite as long. And my second group here is edamame, which is an edible form of the soybean that we know so well here in central Illinois. And why you might think of growing these is that they're high protein. Um, they're one of the few plants that actually possesses all of the uh, necessary proteins for human growth. They are getting more widely known. Uh, another way to diversify your market or set yourself apart. And we have a proven area for soybean production here. Think about the incredible numbers that um, you know soybean growers are getting year to year in central Illinois. And this soil and this climate is just as good for soybeans that are edible um, to people. How do we grow these things? Well, as a legume, um, they fix nitrogen and we can help this along by inoculating the seed with uh, a nitrogen fixing bacteria called Brady Rhizobium japonica. This will be available along with the seed in any seed catalog that you purchase from. Um, they have pretty high um, nutrient needs. It's recommended to apply 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre at planting and then side dress 25 more pounds of nitrogen uh, six weeks after planting. The plants can be spaced uh, at distances about four inches apart to six inches and the rows 18 to uh, 24 inches apart, planting uh, the seeds about an inch deep. This can of course be done with manual equipment or with modified equipment from a commercial soybean uh, business. Plastic mulch for weed control is advised here. Um, really, these things have more in common uh, when they're grown with green beans than with soybeans, since we're talking usually about small farms doing it with lots of hand labor. Uh, plastic mulch is going to uh, prevent some of those weed problems, prevent some disease transmission problems, and make it easier overall on yourself. Um, these plants benefit from soil temperatures of 55 degrees or higher, and they like a soil pH between 6 and 6.5. Uh, under these conditions where we meet 55 degrees or more, we can expect them to emerge in 10 to 14 days and start growing. But which varieties do we plant? Just like uh, regular or commercial soybean, processing soybean, uh, there's different maturity groups across the country. And you have to know which group your seed falls into so that you plant the specific ones that work in your area. For our area, uh, central Illinois here, we're in maturity group Roman numeral three, the Kelly green or medium green on the map on the left. Uh, 
and that means we can use any soybean rated maturity group 3 or less, that is something north of us, groups 2, 1, etc., but not groups 4, 5, and up. Um, knowing this allows you to pick varieties that will actually have enough time, enough frost-free time to mature here um, after they're direct seeded in the spring. There's varieties that will mature in 70 to 120 days, so make sure you pay attention when you're selecting your seed. And one recommendation is to plant two different varieties or two different maturities at the same time. So you could plant a 90 and 120 day crop at the same time and know that for over a month you'll be harvesting edamame. Uh, again, make sure you know your soybean maturity zone before you do this. Hey, Chris, you want to catch a couple of those questions there for you that's relevant sure. to what you're talking about? Okay. Uh, what about growing with clover interplanted? Uh, yeah, that's definitely an option. Uh, that would have certainly reduced uh, some of that need for the nitrogen inputs. I haven't read any specific research on yield comparisons there. I would suspect that there's some competition for nitrogen uh, as well as uh, other nutrients in the soil, but it's certainly worth a try, and that's also going to hold down weeds and serve as a cover crop uh, once you get the edamame out of there. It makes sense to me as a, as something to look at. And what about cover crops with edamame early spring oats? Uh, yeah, cover crops are definitely recommended. Uh, much like production of other vegetable crops, we want that added organic matter. Uh, oats do a great job of doing that. They survive the winter and uh, they can be tilled in real early before we want to get the edamame crop in. Do Asian greens do well with square foot gardening intensively planted? Uh, the greens can. Uh, not all of them are created equal, um, but as you saw in some of the pictures, some of those bok choy uh, rows, for example, were, were planted pretty densely and they do well. Of course, it depends on your ends. If you're looking for a baby crop or a salad mix crop, of those Asian greens, then you'll find that, yeah, in the denser planting, you're preventing weeds and you're getting the size that you want. If you're looking for bunches of those, uh, you're going to find that they won't be as big just due to the density of the planting. Clarify. Edamame likes 55 degrees soil temp. The slide said Asian greens and previous slide, he said 40 to 75. Yes, Asian greens and edamame are totally different. They both do come from Asia, but they don't go according to the same uh, planting conditions. The greens do fall under that range, and edamame as the soybean, which is from family Fabaceae, rather than many of those greens which are not legumes, uh, don't uh, grow according to the same conditions. Deer like edamame. I had a short row with edamame, then green beans. Deer ate right up to the green beans. Yes, that is coming up in the next slide. Deer are definitely a problem, um, and yeah, that goes back to our webinar from last week about <laughs> uh, managing wildlife in your vegetable production system. Uh, check that one out on archive if you didn't attend. Is there a good resource to learn about how to alter commercial equipment for edamame harvesting? Chris, I can answer that. Okay. Um, actually, um, if you look in a lot of the commercial, go ahead and shut your mic off, Chris. Yep, sorry. If you look in your in the owner's manuals for the planters, especially the air or vacuum planters that are commercially available, they'll have setting for like edible beans, and that's basically the size of bean you use. So if it's a vac plant or vacuum planter, they're really easy to uh, to uh, adjust. It, um, and then some others just go by volume; they're easier too. If it if it plants, you know, individual seeds, it gets a little difficult to get some of those set. But uh, the owner's manuals basically go over those. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, so back on the slide here, um, how to do this. Generally, they're hand harvested uh, when pods are filled out. You can feel for firmness just like you would with green beans and expect two to three individual uh, beans per pod. Uh, commercial soybean equipment can be altered, like Kyle just discussed, uh, for easier harvest. This is going to be appropriate if you're growing a significant quantity of edamame. Um, can harvest individual pods or the whole stock. You need to do a little talking to people in your market about what they prefer here. Many Asian markets prefer being sold the whole stock, which you can cut it off at the bottom, remove some of the outer leaves, 
and bunch them up, bunch together, you know, four to six plants and sell it um, as a bunch. In other cases, people are more adjusted to purchasing the pods alone. In either case, first thing, you want to remind customers who are new to edamame that they're eating the beans inside the pod only and not the pod itself. The pod's fibrous and hairy. It's pretty tough. It does not taste good. And for consumers that don't know, it can be a turnoff. Um, Yield-wise, uh, one pound of pods per four feet of row is a general estimate uh, to give you an idea uh, of pre-planning for this season. All right. Is it best eaten fermented? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's where uh, tofu, right, comes from. Uh, but generally, edamame has been bred specifically for its tenderness as a, a fresh eaten crop. Of course, it can be steamed, it can be boiled, um, but light cooking and, and salt are generally recommended. Uh, some common pests here in edamame, like we heard about deer, uh, uh, will definitely eat this, birds, leaf beetles, and aphids. Um, for post-harvest care, we want to wash and store at 32 degrees and 95% humidity, just like the Asian greens in this case. Uh, it has a very short shelf life. We're talking about storage that lasts only five to seven days, so you want to really match this up with your level of production with what you think you can sell. And I, I discussed selling at the stock versus selling it as the individual pods. Uh, on the right is a picture of bunch stocks. You can see it has a nice look to it. People know the quantity they're getting, and uh, it lasts a little bit longer sitting as the whole bunch there. All right, that's all I've got for Asian Greens and Edamame. Thanks, everyone. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, I'm going to actually uh, kind of punt at this point. Uh, our our friend and colleague uh, Mike Rogi, like uh, thousands of other people here in the state, uh, is home with a cold. So I'm going to go over his portion here, and I'm going to throw this out to my colleagues online here too. Um, any of you that want to say anything about the next few slides uh, uh, that Mike has put together, certainly just you know let me know, and, and I'll be glad to give you the mic. Um, but uh, what Mike was going to cover for us was basically on uh, one of the uh, unique aspects of some of these crops are color variations. So um, you might have seen some of these asparagus, um, uh, all different sorts of, of, of beans and, and cauliflower and what have you, sweet corn. Uh, a lot of these you probably have seen in markets. Uh, and the neat thing about a lot of these is, you know, they really draw people to your stand. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why a lot of people grow them. So you know, the why grow some of these with the color variations is uh, it, it adds variety to what you have to offer. Um, it's like, for instance, a picture of potatoes here. Uh, it is a novelty thing. Like I said, it is kind of a, you know, draws people into your stands. The, the color catches their eye. Uh, it enhances your stand a lot. And, um, you know, w why not grow them, you know? Um, I, I, I can't say why not. Uh, they just seem like something that would be a really neat to add to your uh, uh, food stand, market stand. Some of the negatives are with a lot of these products that we're talking about is people may not understand, you know, what they are uh, depending on what the color variation is. Uh, they may think that you have a fruit that is or, or, or a product, a vegetable that's gone bad or isn't quite right, uh, quite ripe yet. So you have to do a little bit of uh, education with uh, people when you do the color variations too. And uh, uh, Kyle. Kyle? The color variation might also be due to added nutrients. It may be correlated to extra nutrients. Good point, James. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, color fastness, uh, so what you'll find is uh, some of these products is another reason to talk with your clientele about them um, is uh, as they cook or how they cook, you know, they may or may not hold their color. And, you know, that's neither good nor bad. It's just something that people need to understand with that. Um, uh, 
uh, so he's got a listing here of some of them that will keep their color. Everybody has, you know, cooked uh, uh, various types of sweet corn out there, and uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it holds its color very well. Some will lose the color, you know, asparagus and then the cauliflower, and if you've had any experience with them. Once again, it's just, uh, it's just basically talking with your with your clients about what's going to happen to them. And uh, generally, with all of these color variations, the longer they're cooked, the less intense the color will be. So they'll they'll lose that, um, and uh, Chris makes a good point here. You know, if you have uh, y are yields different between some of these color variations, what have you? Uh, and the good point that he, I wanted to bring out was that you know, in in the breeding for these, they may not be breeding for as much yield as they do you know the color characteristic of these products. So it's kind of a trade off with them. There's a lot of you that have grown the color variations of these things, so so that's great, uh, very interesting. And you know, here's just a picture once again of you know a really really exciting um, uh, uh, stand here with all these different products. And and remember, even with the color, there's a lot of the cultures where you know they may go to stand of of the products that we are growing here and think they're very boring because there is no color in there. So um, once again, drawing people people to your stand. Uh, is going to be a really good thing for you too. So here are some other variations that we see with eggplants and uh, uh, radishes. There's everything across the board uh, in terms of, of radishes and turnips uh, is another one. You can see the wheel of, of carrots over here on your right hand side uh, and there's a lot of variety there. Um, uh, many times you'll find a lot of these color variations in these crops are uh, heirloom uh, varieties and uh, which which do very well. So there's there's a lot of opportunity out there for these. Okay, so we'll keep going on here a little bit and talk about another um, uh, unique type of vegetable and, and the baby vegetable. So what do we mean by this? Um, as Mike points out here, some of these vegetables are basically fully ripe, you know, miniature sizes of the ve of the vegetables, you know, that we would see uh, otherwise. So the head lettuces, some of the squash, uh, some of the potatoes. He mentions lady thumb potatoes here, and others. So so that's a, a fully mature uh, product that we have out there. Whereas uh, some of the other ones. Um, are just immature vegetables picked before they're fully grown. Okay, so obviously sweet corn, we're used to that, um, and uh, the cauliflower, radishes, beets. He's got the whole thing here. So it can either be a fully ripe product, you know, bred for specifically for that size, or it can just be an immature. Um, a couple, a, a question here: um, Do the colored carrots taste similar to orange carrots? Now, that's a matter of preference. Uh, we can have uh, some of you online that have grown them. You know, what do you think about that? Is there any difference in the taste of the colored uh, carrots versus the others? I personally can't taste anybody um, taste any difference in them. But does anyone else that has grown, and we have a lot of growers on here with uh, some of these color variations, any difference in the taste that you can tell? Just type that into your chat box. I've got several people here clicking in agreement. Yes, there is a difference in the taste. If there is a difference, you know, go ahead and put that in the chat box, and we'll read that. I'll uh, keep going here. Um, a lot of these products um, that I was just talking about, for instance, the smaller products, the baby products, or the ones that are immature, uh, they're extremely perishable. You know, when you've got uh, yellow squash, you know, that is that is harvested that young, the product is not going to last long. So you want to make sure that your harvest schedule is is really really coincides with your your marketing effort, and uh, uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of the time, these type of products will be for specialty markets or restaurants, uh, and Mike mentions higher-end farmers markets. Um, usually, uh, people are buying these for, buying these products for a very specific purpose. But once again, that's not to say that um, you wouldn't want to have them, you know, in your market wherever you're at. It's probably some of these. Uh, the black cherry tomato is very popular. Probably a lot a lot of you have grown that before. So. Um, Let's go on one more here. Okay. Um, thanks for those comments on the taste uh, with all of these. So I'm going to turn it over here to my uh, good friend and colleague, Ellen Phillips, and she's going to walk us through some more of these products. So, Ellen, it's yours. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm up last but not least with a couple of the uh, uh, vegetables here that you can grow. The first one up is Jerusalem Choke, otherwise known as Sun Choke. 
And many of you might recognize that because it is a native perennial vegetable that often uh, can be weedy. In fact, uh, one of the farmers here in the room with me was the first to point that out, that you might have it on your farm already. But certainly there's uh, new varieties out that uh, actually are uh, being grown for the tuber that might be a, a better choice uh, rather than depending on the native that you might have on your property. It is very easy to grow quite productive, um, and it's basically sunflower. So you're going to have a crop that's about 10, 12 feet tall if you allow those flowers to grow. Uh, that usually occurs in that August to October time period. One reason it's gaining some popularity, again, is that it's not like potatoes that are high in starch. Instead, it has a carbohydrate that metabolizes into a natural sugar. And so, especially in the wine and beer production area, it's gaining, gaining some favorability in the market. The other advantage of this is that it doesn't have um, many insect or disease problems. And of course, it being a root crop, it stores fairly well. Let's uh, go on to the next slide. As far as how to grow it, it's fairly simple. It fits well within our growing season here, about 125 frost-free uh, days. Uh, you would normally uh, or could plant it in the fall, and usually that is when it's planted, once temperatures are below 40 degrees. And the main reason for that is you don't want it sprouting. Uh, at that time, you just want it to be in the ground so it comes up in the spring. And if you wait till spring, you might be able to plant it, but it's hard to find the tubers uh, at that point in order to grow. What you are planting is a seed tuber. It's very similar to what you would do to grow potatoes. Uh, it's going to be cut to about one to two ounce um, portions, and you want to have at least two to three buds on each of those uh, slices. And those will be then planted about 45 inches deep and about 16 to 24 inches apart. And uh, a lot of variation in that on recommendations, and it's more uh, according to the equipment and how you think you're going to harvest it come fall or throughout the winter. In season, uh, some research has shown that it is best to go ahead and hill those, very similar to how you would hill a potato in order to increase the tuber size as well as if you want those tubers to be a little larger, then you would cut those flowers uh, before they go to uh, seed in order to increase that start the uh, sugar content. As far as harvesting goes, we do want that sugar content, and so you're not going to harvest until after a killing frost, and so the top growth will actually be wilted at the time that you're harvesting. And be careful, uh, it is a tuber, and same way with potatoes, if you don't harvest at all, you may end up with another crop next year even though you didn't plan on it. So, be, uh, and the, the tuber is going to be a good foot deep sometimes, so dig uh, well when you're harvesting these. Let's go on to the next slide. As far as varieties go, um, there's quite a number out there now. Uh, the Mammoth French Rite is one that you see recommended um, very often. And uh, the Dwarf Sunray is a new one that has a much thinner peel on it, and if you're seeing chefs uh, look for that one uh, uh, according to some of the research. Let's go on to the next slide. Just wanted to show you uh, that there are some farmers out there marketing this. It's, you're, it's, as I said, it's gaining popularity, especially with breweries. The other place it's gaining popularity is with chefs who are focusing on local foods during that winter time. And there's, of course, not many winter crops. And so by providing that as an option, they can work it into stews and other ways that you would uh, serve it very, very similarly to potatoes. Next slide. Bitter melon or bitter gourd is a unique one. It has a lot of cultural appeal to Latin culture, Asian culture, um, Indian culture, uh, used very uh, extensively there. Uh, it is a part of the cucurbit family and as a result is a vine that is grown. It is named appropriately. Um, it is called bitter melon because it can get incredibly bitter depending on how it is grown and what parts are used. That outer um, um, shell that gets there when it's very mature can be quite bitter. But especially for medicinal purposes, there are many cultures who 
would like that. Otherwise, if it's harvested younger, that inner portion um, oftentimes is red, a little bit sweeter, and is a little bit more flexible in some of the ways that it might be used. But again, it's used very extensively in, in cultures from around the world. Average uh, yields are about four to five tons per acre, and it does store well um, in cool conditions. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Because it is a cucurbit, uh, it is grown, uh, enabling those vines to spread readily. Oftentimes, though, it, rather than allowing it to grow on the ground, like you might see cucumbers or squash, it is typically trellised. And those fruits then are allowed to hang down because the fruits are just simply more easy to harvest at that point, and you get end up with fewer diseases. Uh, when that uh, is grown in that way. The variety will make the difference as far as how many days it takes to get to maturity, usually about 100 or 80 to 100 days. But variety, there's a wide um, difference in varieties on a lot of these growing factors. For planting, it's pretty simple. Just simply soak the seeds and plant them two to three seeds per hill. And on the hills, about 18 to 24 inches apart and then put them on the trellis. It is best to go back and prune some of the lateral vining, um, vines off of that in order to uh, keep the production on the main uh, original vines. It is insect pollinated, and so weather can make a difference on that, uh, as well as it does have male and female uh, flowers on it. Uh, particularly in Indian culture, the flowers are valued as well, but be very careful that you're uh, harvesting uh, the uh, female flowers and leaving some male flowers there to make sure for cross-pollination. Because it is in the cucumber family, there can be some pests. And uh, fruit fly is probably the number one that was mentioned over and over in the various publications on how to grow this and cucumber beetle would be another one, similar to our uh, cucumbers uh, that we try to grow otherwise. As far as harvesting go, how you harvest is really towards the market, whether you're going for the younger fruit or the more mature fruit. And there's a market for that whole spectrum in between. So understanding your market and growing this becomes quite important. The storage then is anywhere from two to three weeks in cool, uh, humid conditions. Let's go on to the next slide. I've just listed a few of the varieties that you can get, but there are a whole lot more than that. As you can see on the slide on the right, they are very, very different in appearance. Um, the amount of seed in them, the bitterness in them, the color in the inside of the fruit. And so, as I said, know what the market is wanting and grow that particular type of bitter mullein. Um, in the upper right, it's just you know, one way that it's served. Uh, it's just a boiled uh, vegetable and, and quite good. Uh, if you, it's a taste acquired when you serve it that way. OK. Um, we have one person who said that they have not had as much problem as if it wasn't pruned um, when growing it. So that's a, you know, good advice. Try it both ways. The, it was, was interesting, though, I went to the National Bitter Melon Council in the United States, and they are really trying to promote this uh, to be grown, and they will provide seeds, uh, according to the website, if you're interested in growing it. So it might be worth checking that out if you have any interest at all. The guide that I have down there um, from one of the overseas organizations is a really excellent guide on how to grow this if you decide to take this up as a crop. Let's go to the next slide. The last one, I think, is another one that's quite familiar. Uh, most of us know it as oyster plant. It's a, actually a biennial. Uh, takes two years to complete its life cycle. But usually, it is grown and harvested. There is, uh, as I said, the, the black and purple variety. Um, Particularly, chefs are looking for one uh, uh, that type of variation, so you might consider growing both. Because it's a, a root crop, it is very easy to grow, very productive, very few problems, and worth uh, maybe looking into growing. You can harvest the tops as well as an edible green. Uh, that's an advantage. One of the disadvantages of this, uh, uh, similar to the Jerusalem artichoke, is that 
uh, at least in South Dakota, is considered an invasive weed. We are not there yet in Illinois, but just realize that it can crowd up out anything else in that area where you're trying to grow it. Let's go on to the next slide. As far as growing it, um, it is a, a bit longer in the growing season, um, so at least up here in the north, we're sort of pushing it for our season. Um, but if you plant it early, uh, it will grow. And of course, it depends on the tuber size that you want. Um, you would uh, plant it early spring, uh, plant the seeds about a half inch deep in rows about 18 to 24 inches apart. Again, depends on your equipment and uh, how you're going to harvest it. It is very nice because it's drought hardy, hardy and not too many diseases or pests um, outside of perhaps aphid is the one that I saw most regularly reported. For harvest, the flavor definitely improves if it's gone through a few frost uh, or freeze cycles. So that is something to think about um, as far as uh, your harvest cycling. Uh, the Fruits you would simply dig out. You want to harvest them when they're one to one and a half inches in diameter, about 10 to 12 inches long. If you do plant it too early, the roots can get too large, and at that point they do get tough and woody. So trying to find that balance between getting, getting them to grow during the season but not too large is the real balance. Let's go to the next slide. As far as um, Using them, um, you do, they do need to be tender and uh, free of defects. They are quite easy to store as a root crop. There's not that many varieties out there. The two main ones are the Mammoth and Bellstar. There's a new one called Flora Blue that I saw um, several chefs raving about uh, when they were looking for uh, way, uh, places to purchase it from and because of the flavor. It's a little bit sweeter than the other two as they claim these chefs were making. So one last slide just to show you that uh, there are a couple of folks growing it both in North and Southern Illinois. So it is a possibility and again this is uh, a crop that chefs are looking for because it is a locally grown vegetable that can be used throughout the winter and put onto their um, menus quite easily. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to advance the slide here. Thank you everyone for being on here. Like I said, if you have to leave, go ahead, uh, no problem. But we are going to stay online here and answer some questions here, you know, for however long it takes. So any questions you have, just go ahead and get them in the chat box. And, and as we go into that, waiting for some questions to come up here, um, uh, just want to thank all of the uh, all my colleagues online here. So uh, let's just take a look at what we got going on here. Uh, I'll take the first one. Uh, days between seeding and harvesting arugula. That will depend uh, somewhat on uh, how how mature you want the plant, uh, but it's going to be a pretty quick, you know, harvest. You're going to get within, you know, 30 days or so, you're going to have a product that you can harvest. So it grows really fast, and uh, it's a fabulous product. So really encourage anyone to, to grow that. Um, Lufa gourds. Uh, any of my colleagues or anybody uh, out there have any information on Lufa gourds as a unique product, or any of the growers have any ideas there? Well, Richard, I don't have much info there. Must not be uh, many people growing that one. Uh, we'll have to find out a little more info on that. Um, how many of these crops can be grown hydroponically? Uh, Chris, do you have? Did you grow any of these hydroponically out in, in Oregon? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do it uh, with any of them. Um, I assume that you know that. They of course can be, but in terms of profit margin, I don't see many that are particularly uh, good there unless you're talking about some specialty tomatoes. Or Ellen, I wonder if the, uh, could you think the bitter melon could be grown hydroponically? Did you come across any of that in your research? Um, I would suspect that the bitter melon could be grown hydroponically in the same way you would grow um, cucumber, but I didn't see any research along those lines. Okay, thank you. Um, 
James, can you cover the uh, drying the ginger regarding drying ginger? Um, that's I think that's just naturally air dried, isn't it? Yes, that's that's the most uh, that's the only information I have. It's air dried. So that, well, that, that might, might be, be somewhat shot. similar to like a garlic type, you know, uh, drying garlic, garlic a little bit. Correct. Yes. Uh, Bill has a good question out there, and I'm going to throw it out to the group of all you growers. Um, what kind of difference do you see in uh, prices for the color variations uh, versus the regular varieties? I'll just give my my two cents uh, from talking with Mike and some other other growers I have that grow them. Um, most of them are grown for specialty market, so they're actually, you know, per pound, they're getting more money for them because they're being grown specifically for someone. So, for instance, there may be uh, a restaurant, you know, that wants baby corn, and they're willing to commit to taking X amount of or all of the the product that they're growing. So, on a per pound basis, it's significantly higher. But I would, we'll just read the the chat box here to see what other growers. Uh, have experience with that too. Just a note to everybody, all of these uh, 11 webinars that the Small Farms team is doing are all archived and uh, each Monday when I send out the archive it's the same link for all of them so you can see all of last year's and all of this year's so you'll, you'll be able to see that. Maybe you can give uh the address of your website. I think they are all over there. Yeah, let me get that. So Chris or someone kind of take over the chat box here. Are you there, Chris? There's, there's a question. On yeah, 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 I'm yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. There's a question on Choi. Okay, yeah, I answered in the chat box, but in general, they are pretty well adapted in terms of disease resistance. Um, of course, paying attention to, um, in the seed catalog, which specifics you select, but in general, they're um, adapted to moist environments that do have disease pressures. Um, in general, if you get past the stage where damping off can affect uh, young seedlings, especially if you're transplanting, uh, the harvest times are generally short and you'll be able to avoid significant disease problems in most cases. Chris, I, I have one, uh, Chris Konechka, I have one question for the group, and I'm asking this as a grower myself. Um, do, you, do you know anything, or have you had experience with the choice growing them both by direct seeding and transplant? I've only uh, direct seeded them. Okay, thanks. I, I have growers that actually, uh, to get a jump on the uh, getting them in their tunnels, have transplanted them and have gotten along very well. And uh, it's just it's just an observation, but it seems like you'll find a, a preference that either transplanting or, or direct seeding works very well for you. So that's something to consider as you grow them. Okay, and Pam has mentioned. Uh, Kang Kong and Chinese water spinach. Uh, must be a choy variety. That's a new one for me. Oh, okay. And our colleague Andrew comes to the rescue again. Water spinach has been deemed invasive in Illinois. Hmm. Thank you, Andrew. So ginger and turmeric will not overwinter in this uh, environment. Indeed, if you have to hold the seed, you have to provide them with the warmth necessary and the relative humidity that is uh, needed. So they are not very good at holding to, to lower temperatures. Uh, also, in addition to the uh, ginger and, and turmeric, um, you'll want, if you decide you want to grow that, you'll want to get on the list and get your the, the rhizomes basically ordered very early because they they sell out almost immediately upon uh, letting their growers know that they have the product. It, don't wait and think you're going to get product. You want to, to be honest with you, if you're going to grow it next year, you want to be on a mailing list uh, or be in touch with your supplier right now. Would that be good advice, James? 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. I want to thank you all for being online here today, and I uh, hope you got uh, uh, some information to help you maybe get involved in some of these markets and growing some of these products. And on behalf of the University of Illinois Small Farms team, uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate having you here, and I hope that we can get you uh, involved in some more programming uh, in the near future. So everyone can sign off at this point, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>